I wanted to introduce um, the reason that we're here today is the Person-Centred Care Stakeholder Consultation Series. This is in fact the second um, meeting in this series um, and the focus of the session today is what is the evidence supporting a person-centred care approach within the HIV response. So a quick um, housekeeping instructions for participants today. We will um, be sharing a link in the chat to a Google Jamboard. And on the Google Jamboard, um, we're hoping that you'll, uh, you know, really engage and share your thoughts, your questions, um, anything that comes to you. We have a lot of information coming your way shortly from our um, presenters today. And we really just want to take this opportunity to engage with all of you. Um, so really, this is your opportunity to, to um, share your feedback, share your thoughts, share your questions. Each, um, I'll, I'll give a quick little instructions on the Jamboard and how that works in just a sec. Um, but if you've got any technical issues, um, feel free to, to raise those in the chat. But if you've got any sort of thoughts around person-centered care, we please, could you direct those to the Jamboard? The slides will be sent to all participants after the uh, meeting today. So please don't worry about taking detailed notes from the slides. We will be having um, breakout groups after the presentations. The breakout groups should be around 15 minutes or more, depending on how we go. Um, and we really, this is your chance to really speak up and, and engage and have a, um, a discussion with, with our um, panelists. So we do ask you to stay on mute um, during the presentations. So just in case um, you're not familiar with the, the Jamboard, you should be um, getting the link in the chat shortly. And uh, feel free to go here. This is kind of what it will look like. This is the first slide when you get there. If you want to um, move between the slides, you can see there's 14 or so, maybe a few more slides now we've added. So you can adjust, um, go back and forth with these little arrows up here at the top. And then if you want to add new stickies, this is the little, the fourth button on the left is the one to add a new sticky. Um, and that's basically like a virtual post-it note. You can just then start typing your thoughts. You can change the color of your sticky. You can change the size of your sticky. Just be real, be respectful of other people's stickies and uh, try and move yours so it doesn't overlap too much. Um, don't delete anybody else's stickies um, <laughs> and just try and keep the boards a little bit organized. But you know, we'll also be taking the time to, to organize the boards. So what are the objectives of this stakeholder consultation series? So the, we have two objectives. The first one is to provide a platform for exchange on the concept of person-centered care within the HIV response. And the second objective um, are really for, for all of these discussions, learning, recommendations, and the conversation that we have today and in the following meetings to form the basis of a joint commentary article to build further consensus around the concept of person-centered care within the HIV response. Um, we do hope that this will lead to providing specific recommendations for different groups of stakeholders as they continue their work towards realizing the full potential of person-centered care within the HIV response. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the second meeting in the series. The first meeting was held in July uh, last year in Montreal at the AIDS 2022 conference. We now are beginning this series of three events um, this month and the following two months, we will have these virtual um, conversations over Zoom with all of you. And then we will have a, another in-person event at the IAS 2023 conference in Brisbane in July this year. So as I said, the, today the objective is really to take stock of the current evidence supporting the contribution of person-centered care to the well-being and health outcomes of people living with and affected by HIV. And the discussion questions today, um, I won't go through all of these now because you hopefully are familiar with them from the pre-reading, plus they are um, we have a slide for each one of these discussion questions in the Jamboard. So this is where, you know, to, as you're having the breakout groups, as you're listening to the presentations, this is where you can think about each of these questions and put your stickies in the, the relevant page. So what's the order of events today? Um, the first, we're going to share some personal stories from some of our person-centered care advocates, and then we'll be launching into the presentations um, that you can see here. 
Um, then as I mentioned, the breakout groups and we will have a report back and a moderated discussion. So now I'm gonna introduce our moderator for today, who is Laura Barris. Um, Laura holds a PhD from John Hopkins University where she is faculty in the Department of International Health. She is a social and behavioral scientist who uses implementation science and participatory approaches such as human-centered design and mixed methods approach mixed methods research to develop and evaluate strategies to optimize quality engagement in HIV prevention, care and treatment services internationally. And she has more than 15 years living and working in Lesotho and Zambia. So I'm gonna play the stories now and then hand over to Laura. Thanks everyone. Hello everyone, my name is Daisy Kuala. I'm a health right activist, currently working with Bar Hostess Empowerment and Support Program to champion for the health rights of uh, people living with HIV within our cohort. So I'm here today to share uh, with you story of Annie, one of our P people living with HIV client who was started on ARVs and was uh, uh, not able to attend viral suppression due to her not adhering well to her drugs, especially in the hot spots where they, uh, they sell sex. The, uh, the area didn't have confidentiality. So uh, Annie was supported with one of our peer navigators who was able to help us in help her in terms of uh, storing uh, uh, drugs for her and also being a support a supporter, calling her and reminding her of uh, her timing of taking ARV. So through this, uh, uh, Annie um, uh, was able to adhere well to her drugs and attain viral suppression. Currently, Annie works in the hotspot to support uh, our fellow people living with HIV, uh, attain viral suppression and adhere well to their drugs. So that is the story of Annie from Bar Hostess to the World. I'm Charmaine and I am a psychologist from the Philippines. It is my first time dealing with people living with HIV and it was a very profound experience. The program we handled was focused on the empowerment of people living with HIV who are unemployed. The program itself was divided into different parts, which focused on meaningful relationship with self, others, developing an optimistic outlook in life, and also improving their quality of life. A particular activity was identifying and handling stigma and discrimination, wherein the participants were able to practice how to effectively deal with stigma through situational analysis. It was a very powerful experience, witnessing the start of the healing process of each participant, and at the same time, eye-opening for me, which made me feel really hopeful and optimistic as we move forward in providing care and treatment to people living with HIV. And as the world shifts the paradigm of HIV care into a more person-centered approach, the need to address non-biomedical needs of people living with HIV becomes more apparent, yet community-based mental health services and social economic support for people living with HIV in the Philippines remain limited. The seventh edition of the Philippine AIDS Medium Term Plan specified the integration of mental health and HIV interventions as part of person-centered care principles. However, inequity in access to psychosocial economic interventions persists and the lack of HIV proficient psychologists remains the utmost concern. Because HIV care is not integrated into the current mental health programs, these facilities are expected to have limited capacity to address the intersecting issues of HIV and mental health. But we are hopeful that there will be passionate health professionals like Charmaine who can pave the way in making these improvements in the area of non-biomedical interventions and psychosocial support. My name is Rod, a Filipino nurse and one of the advocates of IAS person-centered care. So that's it for me. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today and over to you, Laura. Brilliant. And thank you so much to, to Rod and Charmaine and Daisy for their their work um, as activists and providers and for sharing stories to help center us on, on why we're having this conversation. It's my honor to be a moderator, to get to listen to the voices in the, the virtual rooms across the world today and to get the chance to present, um, to, to introduce fellow presenters. So I see we still have quite a few folks on the 
consultation who are not currently using the Jamboard. Um, it may be that some are not able to, and certainly your voice will have the chance to be heard when we break into discussion groups. You can just speak verbally the, the questions and the thoughts that you have. But if you haven't had the opportunity to click on the Jamboard link in the chat, highly encourage you to do so. Um, that what's posted there will help to, to move what we talk about today into um, the next phase of this work as well. With that, um, let me introduce our first presenter, uh, thinking about evidence around HIV person-centered care. Uh, Dr. Elvin Gang is a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Medicine at the University of Washington in St. Louis. He is also the director of the Center for Dissemination and Implementation at the Public Health Research at the Public Health Institute at the same university. Using the, ends of the lens of implementation science, Dr. Gang conducts research to advance the use of evidence-based interventions in the public health response to HIV and COVID-19. Dr. Gang has been a member of the World Health Organization's Guideline Development Group for HIV and, a, and on the Commission for Human Resources for Health in Rwanda, convened by the National Academies of Science. Dr. Gang is an academic editor at PLOS Medicine, an editorial board member of JADES and the Journal of the International AIDS Society, and serves as the editor for implementation science at current HIV and AIDS reports. Recently, in collaboration with colleagues in Zambia, he's helped lead a, a cluster randomized trial to assess an intervention to improve patient centeredness of HIV care. And it's my pleasure to introduce him now to discuss PCC frameworks and guidance, um, NWHO guidance on person centered care. Thanks, Alvin. Um, good morning. Um, thanks um, for that. Um, um, in introduction. Um, um, good to see uh, a lot of folks on this call, um, some familiar faces, my colleagues, um, my co-presenters. Um, I see Kombatende and some others uh, that we've worked closely with, and so good to, good to see some old faces and some new ones as well. Um, so I think um, I'm going to be brief this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, frameworks and um, the ways that people have been thinking about person-centered um, care, uh, person or patient-centered care, um, and gonna just reflect a little bit about um, what these constructs, I think, um, imply for our emerging um, challenges and opportunities in the HIV response. Um, um, but these are uh, some provisional ideas and look forward to um, people thinking and, and um, uh, working with this conversation going forward. I'm going to try to do the screen share, see if I can get this correct. Okay, very good. So um, just to say that the, um, this morning I'm doing some um, reporting of collective thinking that has been done by this group and, and many others. Um, so uh, this, this, this morning, I think I'm going to start out by um, maybe the proposition that patient or person-centeredness seems intuitive and also seems quite uh, a very natural fit with the spirit of the HIV response. So maybe the question going forward is how do we implement it and integrate it into routine um, service provision? Um, I think the answer in part uh, it will depend on developing a more concrete shared conceptualization of it in our field, in our response. Um, and to think uh, clearly about how perhaps uh, it can speak to present day challenges in the HIV response, and then to develop models or approaches or interventions that activate key mechanisms in, in, this, um, in this domain. I think we face many challenges. There is scarcity uh, in global resources for the HIV response. We have new challenges every day, and we have vast heterogeneity in the success of our responses. Um, and each of these, I think, uh, poses unique difficulties, uh, but perhaps also opportunities for person and patient centeredness. Um, so to be brief, um, person centeredness uh, is widely called for. Here's just um, a paper by uh, Peter Ehrenkrantz and others um, calling for uh, truly patient centered care. Um, and there are many uh, empiric and commentary papers uh, looking at this. Um, but in, in reality, uh, we also know that there are challenges and difficulties to this. This paper is from um, a colleague of mine uh, who 
noted, um, as many others have, that the day-to-day -day receipt of services is oftentimes um, not perhaps as patient-centered as, as, we, as we would like. So how do we get from uh, concept to, to practice? And certainly there are many complexities here and none of these um, explanations or uh, uh, ideas about how to move things forward are, are complete. But I think that there is at this point in the conversation, a, a, a moment of reflection that we can take about developing conceptual clarity around the 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 notion um, to think about the mechanisms of how it could be applied um, and to think about operationalization. And I just have a few quotes from papers that I will uh, discuss with you all in a moment calling for these things um, from Scholl calling for conceptual clarity, demand, um, discussing barriers and Santana uh, thinking about how to how to operationalize. So um, to be brief, and just to cover some of the conceptual terrain, I'm gonna run through a few uh, of, of the recent um, publications and voices about uh, PCC or pa patient or person-centeredness conceptually, um, and, then, and then propose how we might, at least to begin with, uh, weave some of it together. So, so Scholl uh, and colleagues have uh, presented a, a review that seeks to unpack this vast area. And they have many, many constructs in it, but they're divided into three. Um, and, uh, and these being sort of enablers, um, you could think of these as stru structural or other contextual factors that help, uh, such as integration, access, and coordination. And um, Jules just mentioned uh, the importance of access uh, at the onset of this conversation in the chat. Principles, so, so having to do with the characteristics of the provider, biosocial view and um, and activities, um, sort of empowerment and shared decision-making. Um, in a similar vein, um, Demand and, and colleagues have talked about this. I think of this a little bit in a sort of socio-ecologic framework, um, socio-economic basis, structural um, factors, and then ending with healthcare worker behavior that is both enabled and constrained by the factors that undergird it. Um, and uh, if we continue looking in the landscape, um, we start to see that many of these frameworks do land on the same constructs. Green and colleagues here talk about patient centeredness as being composed of structural issues having to do with the clinic, clinical issues, and, and interpersonal, such as communications and training. So these are, these are all um, not exactly the same, but, um, but you can see that there is some clear overlap in these concepts. Um, Finally, I'm going to end with this one. There are many other constructs out there, but this one I uh, felt was from the, the Health Foundation in the U UK lended a slightly different lens to this issue um, and started with sort of the overarching theme of dignity and compassion um, within which care is personalized, coordinated, and and importantly, in enabling of um, patient um, and person part participation in ownership. So um, I think given all of these uh, different um, approaches, which are, as I've mentioned, not entirely different, how can we think of this as a, as a roadmap for um, perhaps research and knowledge generation about it? And where, where do these stand with regard to the HIV response? Um, I'm gonna, again, just to provoke conversation, perhaps, um, lay out what I think might be a way that we could weave these things together. Um, and I'm gonna invoke um, a term that um, maybe we'll just touch on but not go too much into, structuration theory. But the idea I think here is that systems affect how people work and how people work affect how systems um, are constructed. And there is a cycle in which these two things are neither completely separate um, um, are not completely separate and continue to, to influence each other. And if we think about our research landscape, it's important to understand um, with perhaps greater uh, acuity than we have, even though there is work in this regard, um, these two dynamics, how systems affect or constrain um, actors in that system to deliver and to receive and to participate in patient-centered care, as well as how um, actors in that system, whether they're healthcare workers, administrators, patients, communities, or others, um, can influence the, the capacities, the rules, and the regulations of that structure. 
I think that's half of the um, perhaps uh, constructs we have here. And the other half then is to understand the uh, the effects on each of this uh, of this dynamic on on the patient experience and patient outcomes. I think we have um, some data about each of these four domains of research. I've listed a few here. Um, you can see sort of looking at effects of structures on 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 experience. Uh, a paper by Zanoni, actors effects on experience. Um, some work by Sikombe. Um, but in in general, this could provide some basis for thinking about an evidence base. So let me just um, wrap up briefly here. Um, I think how this plays out in our HIV response is um, a moving target. We have empowerment and we have many um, um, dynamics in, in our public health response that continue to demand our attention and um, our care. Um, we think about activism and empowerment versus stigma and marginalization verticalized funding versus our trajectory towards universal health coverage, workforce um, building versus burnout, um, and a number of other important um, uh, dynamics that we must sort out and think through how person-centered um, and patient-centered work uh, can advance um, um, each of the, can help us um, break through these um, dynamics. But let me, let me end there. I think this is just to provoke a little bit of conversation um, and I think just to finish this out, to say that I, I think we recognize in public health, it's not about who gets there first, but making sure we all arrive and personalizing um, this work um, um, in public health practice is is both possible and perhaps will help us get all to the finish line. Um, and we have work to do to contextualize and integrate this into existing program. So. Let me stop there and hand it back over to my colleague and happy to have some discussion about these um, provisional thoughts. Brilliant, Alvin, thank you so much. I appreciate the overview of some of the existing uh, frameworks that are out there as well as extending and, and giving us some really interesting um, constructs to take into the discussion. We see folks using the Jamboard, which is great. Now, again, if you're not able to, please go ahead and use the go and, and make some notes and let's talk. Um, let's talk when we get into breakout rooms. But very grateful to think about the, the existing work on what are the concepts and constructs that that comprise this, this area of person-centeredness. And with that, I'm going to turn and invite um, a fortunate, fortunate to be a colleague with Dr. Marie-Claude Lebois. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health and Director of Strategic Information and Evaluation at the Center for International Health, Education, and Biosecurity at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She's a public health professional with more than 10 years of experience in epidemiological methods, research, program management, monitoring, evaluation, and health policy development. Her areas of interest include women's health, maternal and child health, health system strengthening, inter injury and violence prevention, and person-centered care. And she's here to present evidence on patient-centered outcomes, um, a systematic review that I will, I will let her introduce. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Good afternoon, good morning to everyone. So first, I'd like to, to thank IAS for the invitation to present on the evidence of person-centered care intervention among people living with HIV in low and middle income countries, a systematic review. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the team of collaborators that have worked on the systematic review, Laura, Elvin, Ingrid, Chris, Noel, Ashley, Nathan, to name a few. We're going to jump right into the, the systematic review objectives that we'll be presenting. So the first one is what type of PCC intervention intended to improve patient-provider interaction have been employed to support HIV-related outcomes among people living with HIV in low- and middle-income countries. As you all know, PCC is, is vast. So in order to operationalize the systematic review, we focus on the patient-provider interaction, intervention that focus on that aspect. The second part is what are the effects of person-centered strategy that focus on improving patient-provider and interaction on HIV cascade, the outcome and patient provider experience. The methods, um, 
So we conducted a comprehensive review of different database up to January 2023. We use uh, three main guiding framework. Um, as outlined by Elvin, one of them was the Shoal. So the Shoal person center nest framework includes 15 dimensions. Those dimensions are represented in this figure. The method we conducted the narrative synthesis. We originally intended to, to conduct a meta analysis, but due to the clinical and methodological heterogeneity of the included studies, we pursue with the narrative synthesis. And risk of bias was assessed using different tools based on the study design. So today I will share with you some of the primary finding of that systematic review. So we review over 6,000 records and among them, 33 unique studies met our inclusion criteria. As you can see in this map, in this map uh, out of 33 studies, uh, 29 were from Africa. In terms of study design, uh, um, we had 10 studies that were observational RCT and cluster RCT compromise of nine studies. For study population, the vast the forty eight percent of the studies were among adults, and work pointing that only two studies focused on key population, and both of those studies included sex workers as their population. Intervention PCC intervention type. So, what type of intervention did we found? So first, the vast majority of studies included person-centered intervention as part of a multi-component intervention versus being the sole intervention. We used six uh, emerging themes that came across while reviewing those uh, intervention. Those uh, types uh, are provided here. So as you can see, 48% of the studies uh, included an intervention strategy focusing on providing friendly and welcoming services, followed by individualized counseling and patient-centered communication. We also wanted to map uh, the different intervention on the Shoal person-centeredness framework. The person-centeredness framework by Shoal has 15 dimensions. And when we map the intervention that were included in the studies, uh, as you can see here, clinician-patient relationship and clinician-patient communication was included in most studies. Less frequently was coordination and continuity of care, as well as integration of medical and non-medical care. When we look at study outcomes that were reported, the viral suppression was reported among 45% of the studies, and 24% of the study reported a PCC-related outcome. And when I'm going to refer to a PCC-related outcome, what I'm referring is, for example, patient satisfaction, patient-provider communication from the patient perspective, the perceived quality of services uh, from clients, as well as economic related outcome, but from the patient perspective. So here are the results that decide, summarize, kind of condense the key finding of the systematic review. So I will orient you to this graph. So this is the percentage of the study with a comparison group that report a positive effect of the intervention. So if we look at the HIV care cascade, what it tells us is along the cascade, 44 to 50% of the included study reported a positive effect. So what does it mean for the remaining of the studies? So the remaining of the studies had no effect and there was no intervention that led to a negative impact on those outcomes. When we looked at PCC outcome, really encouraging news is, as you can see here, patient provider communication, perceived quality of care, economic related outcome from the patient perspective, all of them reported a positive effect of the intervention with mixed result for patient satisfaction and other PCC related outcome. And as part of this systematic review, we tried to untangle which component of the intervention had an effect uh, 
on the on the um, on the outcome. So here you can see the six categories of PCC intervention types uh, and kind of a heat map across the outcomes. I'll just provide like two as an example. So for example, for friendly services, what it tells us is that intervention that reported a friendly services component, all of them had a positive impact on these outcomes at the exception of ART initiation. While training patient and empowerment and communication skills and patient and communication led to more diversity in terms of the results. So discussion, challenge, and opportunity. So first I will summarize the key finding of the systematic review. So 44 to 50% of the study reported a positive effect on HIV care uh, cascade outcomes. Um, the remaining had no effect. Uh, among the studies reporting PCC-related outcome with a comparison group, all of them reported at least uh, one positive effect of the intervention um, based on the outcome reported. Most studies included adults with very few focusing on children and key population. And PCC-related outcome was measured in one, of, one out of four studies, even though that the main focus or part of the intervention was patient-centered. Yeah, but if you want a may increase, honestly, I mean, I could get you the appointment and still have her call you. Thank you. Wow. So challenge gaps, and I think this provides kind of the, the platform to have a discussion about how do we move forward in this field. So limited description of the intervention and understanding through which mechanism do the intervention operate. There was heterogeneity in outcome definition and measurement and consistent inclusion of person-centered related outcome. Often the patient voice was often missing. Yeah. Few studies included key population. So some some of the opportunity to move the field. Then. So having realistic review with stake and goal engagement, uh, stakeholder engagement to better understand the mechanism to inform guideline and policy. Guidelines on person-centered related outcome and measurement to improve consistency, comparison, and application. From PCC good practice statement to guidelines, how do we operationalize it? Inclusion of participatory research, and also the need for integration of HIV and non-HIV services. So I'd like to thank you for your time, and I'd like to acknowledge the Life Seal team, Bill and Menenda Gate Foundation, WHO, and IAS. And if you're interested to learn more about the Life Project, the link is included. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Mike Claude. Interesting. There's a lot of uh, a lot of positive change that we see from studies, although not exclusively, and and uh, some opportunities to improve the evidence base that you've highlighted. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next two presenters. But while I'm doing that, you'll see a poll um, that has come up on your screen as well, and we'd love to know more about what your primary perspective to to understanding person centeredness in HIV care is. So thank you for submitting there. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ibu Chio, the Senior Technical Advisor at PATH International. He's a senior health professional with strengths in projects and programs implementation, management, and strategic alliances, and the author of more than 40 peer-reviewed publications. His areas of professional expertise include HIV and AIDS clinical research, project and program implementation, data analysis, and he's responsible for establishing the Botswana-Harvard AIDS Institute partnership and five clinical trial sites for the co conduct of multiple HIV intervention studies. His research studies topics include prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV, vaccine trials, antiretroviral treatment interventions, and basic science laboratory research. With him, it's also my pleasure to introduce Chris Collins, the president and CEO of Friends of the Global Fight. Chris joined Friends in 2016 and serves as its president and CEO. He leads the organization's efforts to engage US decision makers in the life-saving work of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Previously, as Chief of the Community Mobilization Division at UNAIDS, Chris helped make the case for investment in civil society as an essential part of the AIDS response. As Vice President and Director of Public Policy at AMFAR, Chris defended global AIDS research and program funding and worked to advance domestic HIV policy and global key populations programming in the US. 
Chris authored the first monograph that inspired the effort to create the first comprehensive US national HIV and AIDS strategy, then coordinated the successful advocacy push to establish the strategy, leading to important policy reforms. He helped develop and manage the International Treatment Preparedness Coalition Missing the Target series of reports on global HIV treatment scale-up, which received international attention. Chris co-founded and served as executive director at AVAC, an internationally recognized HIV research and prevention advocacy group. Thank you to both of you for your presentations today. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, would like to take this opportunity to thank also the IAS for inviting us to share our preliminary result. Uh, as Laura mentioned, my colleagues Chris Collins and I will be co-presenting findings from a study uh, that passed GSI and the friend of the global fight against a tuberculosis and malaria conducted over the last uh, six months, exploring integrated person-centered care in HIV as a bridge to universal health coverage. Next slide, please. We know that uh, advances in treatment have greatly improved the life expectancy of people living with HIV, that also HIV response has pioneered service delivery strategies that work for diverse people in different settings. However, despite those gains, uh, progress toward the two, uh, 2030 HIV epidemic control has stalled. And in addition to that, people living with HIV have also faced, are still facing uh, factors that affect their quality of life, including non-HIV related uh, diseases, stigma and discrimination. At the same time, uh, the global community are uh, working toward as uh, a universal health care, uh, next uh, health care. And in addition to that, uh, there have been a call by international expert to really uh, ask for additional funding for integrated person-centered care as mechanism to get HIV response back on track and for a pathway toward uh, universal health care. Next slide, please. Next slide. So um, we conducted a literature review and 30 uh, key informant interview to explore how integrated person-centered care uh, is being utilized in HIV response, the lesson learned area for improvement, but also opportunity to expand HIV IPCC services to address a broader range of health needs. And the interview focused on three main questions. The first one, how can HIV service better deliver IPCC that respond to the broader healthcare need of people living with and affected by HIV? We did probe into barrier and opportunity at the policy, funding, and operational level. We also asked participants for their organization, uh, in their organization, how they are currently supporting or working to advance IPCC in HIV services. And for implementers and researchers, we ask them and we probe into the importance of co-location of services, one-stop shop model or multidisciplinary care team in facilitating IPCC. The second question was how can IPCC within the HIV platform be expanded to address all the health need and barrier uh, hampering expansion? And for that second question, we ask implementers about uh, strategies they have used to advance IPCC and service integration within the context of disease or health area focus project. We also ask about key issues that might affect the delivery of IPCC for key and marginalized populations. For the last question, how can this identify model influence effort to expand access to primary health care? We did probe on how we might move toward integrating HIV services into PHC without compromising quality. Next slide, please. So what we did also to facilitate discussion with our participant during the key informant interview is to provide them with our working definition of integrated person-centered cares, as well as the key attribute of IPCC. Next slide. Next slide. So what did we learn uh, from the desk review and those key informant interview? Next slide. 
So what we learn is that when it comes to IPCC in HIV, one size does not fit all because different contexts, epidemic type, and also population necessitate different service delivery approach. And differentiated service delivery uh, facilitate clients' choice by providing a many of option, but also integration of HIV services in mainstream PHC system improve access and satisfaction for some, but not all. And that's why we think that it is important to order to offer integrated services package through specialized delivery channel for key and marginalized population who are not well served at public health facility or public uh, primary care, care facilities. What we also learn is that improving the convenience of health services improve health outcome. And we have the common three models uh, uh, very frequently cited, the one-stop shop model, the DSD model that we know very well uh, within the HIV field, and also that advance in health technology facilitate point of care diagnostic and offer methods for delivering treatment and prevention. But also most importantly, that community are essential part in IPCC because we have seen that community-led response are a key pillar in HIV response and critical for mitigating health system gap. They play a big role in community-led uh, monitoring as well as uh, what the, our partner uh, participant uh, really articulated is that the community contribution need to be recognized for the scale and also compensated. Next slide, please. But also that HIV can contribute to health service integration within the two model, non-HIV specific services into HIV service delivery platform. And very often uh, we have seen it in the field and in uh, publication, you know, integration of sexual health services and screening and treatment for non-communicable disease and viral hepatitis, for example, as a part of care package for people living with HIV or the other way around HIV services into non-HIV specific delivery platform and very often in the field HIV screening and linkage to care at family planning and reproductive health uh, ward. But also that HIV response has strengths and health system enabling IPCC expansion. And we have seen that HIV programming and investment have contributed to overall pandemic response and health system strengthening through uh, upgrading health facilities infrastructure, advo uh, advancing laboratory surveillance and health information system, enabling multi-disease diagnostic platform, but also the financing and treatment healthcare worker that have been uh, you know, pushed uh, uh, within the HIV aid field. And uh, the COVID is really uh, uh, one disease that people highlight in how HIV uh, infringement have contributed to strengthening the health system. You know, uh, we have seen that the HIV finance structure and platform have rapidly been pivoted to help in the response to COVID-19 pandemic. For example, in Vietnam, uh, staff from key population uh, led or own clinic, for example, providing usually HIV were pivoted to uh, provide uh, COVID vaccination that uh, the Minister of Health of Vietnam initiated. The same uh, apply also to India where they use the HIV health information system to really uh, uh, monitor uh, their COVID pandemic. Uh, I will pass uh, the next uh, series of slides to my colleagues, uh, Chris. Thank you very much, Abu. And um, now we wanted to uh, look at some of the recommendations that we're developing following from the research that we did. Next slide, please. So uh, first of all, the need to further scale um, person-centered care services uh, within HIV um, and to work towards making uh, person-centered care standard practice. Then integrate services incrementally. This is something we heard from several of the people we talked to that um, one size doesn't fit all here, that we need to, you know, you need to learn by doing um, and be very thoughtful at each step. Next. Then can we do a better job of monitoring and using the results to inform person-centered care um, 
expansion. So quality focused indicators and complementary mechanisms that can help us measure and report on, on progress, keep quality control, but also get the word about out about the impact we're making. And four is to um, recognize that service integration, um, if we're thinking about HIV person-centered care as a bridge to other services, um, integrated services are not a fit for all populations, including key and marginalized populations in many settings who will continue to need standalone, often community-based services that are focused um, on their particular needs. And we need to sustain those focused um, services, even as we think about integration where possible. Next slide. Um, and then, you know, on a policy level, we need to think about ways to incentivize innovation in scaling person-centered care, uh, using technological innovations, um, and other ways to, to scale person-centered care. And then really the need for new health investments, but we are chronically under-investing in HIV and global health in general. Um, and we need to increase investments in a variety of areas, including workforce, support and training, community-led responses, information systems, and other areas of HIV. Next slide. And then do a better job of supporting and preparing healthcare workers to deliver person-centered care uh, with sustained investment in healthcare workers, training, mentoring, um, pay, um, payment for their hard work. And also then ensure, number eight, ensure transparent, inclusive, inclusive engagement um, that we've seen, you know, in the HIV response that the role of communities and society in helping design and deliver programs is absolutely essential to their unique success. Next slide. So three critical takeaways from our uh, look at this is invest in the healthcare workforce, strengthen and support community responses, and do a better job of using monitoring to improve service quality. Next slide. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you to both of you for those contributions and a lot to think about as, as we consider the different aspects of integrating person-centered care and HIV as we, we work toward universal health coverage as well. So uh, the results of the poll came up uh, briefly if folks saw them and where we've got a reasonable distribution, some folks in each of the categories of program implementer, researcher, advocate, person living with HIV and healthcare provider. And we are looking forward to getting into the breakout groups uh, after this next presentation on the current evidence um, around person-centeredness in HIV care. And it is my, my pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Lazarus. Jeffrey is the head of the Health Systems Research Group at IS Global, an associate professor at the University of Barcelona, as well as a senior scholar at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. He earlier served as professor at the LUHS Medical Academy, Lithuania, and as an affiliated professor at CHIP, the WHO Collaborating Center on HIV and Viral Hepatitis at the University of Copenhagen and the University of Porto in Portugal. He's an author of more than 300 publications and is principal investigator of global, of multiple global consensus statements, as well as network research and policy studies. So we will hear from him now on HIV, on um, strategies for long-term success. And um, then we'll move into our breakout groups. Can you hear it? My name is Jeff Lazarus. I'm a professor at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy in New York City and head of the health systems team at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health in Spain. I've been asked to give a brief update about strategies for long-term success in HIV. Importantly, less than a year ago, WHO agreed on a new strategy for HIV covering the period up to 2030 aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals. It calls for a focus to reach the most affected and at risk of HIV AIDS to address inequities as they prevent the world from ending the HIV and AIDS epidemic. So this is not necessarily the novelty, but what I think is important in this strategy is one that it's longer than five years, but also it calls for a more holistic people centered care approach focused on long term well being. So going beyond the immediate focus we've had on antiretroviral therapy and viral suppression. Uh, 
And if you look at the continuum of care, which we're all familiar with from the 390s and now the 395s, you'll see on the far left that prevention is included with a special call out to reaching all priority or key populations. But at the bottom, in addition to the diagnosis, treatment, and viral suppression outcomes, there's additional key outcomes. And importantly, achieving good health-related quality of life is mentioned in a WHO strategy for the first time. So I think that's where we really need to focus our attention on understanding what that means and what it will take to achieve good health-related quality of life. One thing it will take is to have a quantitative target, and that's really one of the, the shortcomings of the new WHO strategy. Not having a target on this means we need to think as a global community of what the target or targets will be and get alignment around the world so we can start measuring this, have a baseline, and make sure that all countries are lined up to achieve that target on good health-related quality of life by 2030. So, you know, one of the purposes of these convenings from the International AIDS Society is to focus on this paradigm shift, this, this new era from, um, for HIV care when we're transitioning from disease-centered health systems and HIV care to more holistic and people-centered HIV care within hopefully integrated health systems. You can imagine it like this, you know, focusing on the disease, the virus, different aspects of it, focusing primarily on getting people diagnosed and through to viral suppression to a more holistic approach, a people-centered HIV care approach that focuses on long-term well-being, including quality of life. To contribute to this change ahead of the WHO strategy that was approved in 2022, a global multidisciplinary panel of 44 HIV experts, including people with lived experience, clinicians, and researchers, was convened to identify key issues that health systems must address to move beyond their focus on viral suppression and advance the long-term well-being of people living with HIV from a patient-centered perspective. We agreed on a set of statements about what this means, as well as five key next steps for health systems to advance this agenda, the agenda of long-term well-being of people living with HIV. We called for a focus uh, on incorporating the monitoring of comorbidities in electronic health records. We can't just rely on cohort studies. We need to capture the comorbidities that people living with HIV have. We need to think of additional frameworks that go beyond that narrow focus on viral suppression, but also address healthy aging, frailty, functional ability, and other dimensions of health that are relevant for people who, uh, living with HIV using HRQOL or just quality of life as a key measure. We need to, as always, reduce access to services from marginalized and vulnerable populations. We need to collect and document data on HRQOL, as mentioned, or QOL. We need global agreement on which tools to use to capture um, patient reported outcomes and, and experiences. Um, including addressing stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings, but in society more generally. This has been one of the big challenges, and certainly from a health systems perspective, we should be able to eliminate stigma and discrimination in the healthcare settings, and I think that will contribute to addressing it um, in society at large. Following the consensus statement and the WHO global strategy, um, we've been thinking about what it means to really have long-term success. And here's the LTS framework that was published just a few weeks ago in HIV medicine. Again, a panel came together and highlighted five main issues which need to be addressed to achieve long-term success in light of the new WHO strategy that puts more attention on issues, on outcomes beyond um, viral suppression. So you can see here um, there's in, in a continued emphasis on sustained undetectable viral load, a minimal impact of treatment and clinical monitoring, but also optimizing health-related quality of life, lifelong integration of healthcare, and again, stigma and discrimination-free society. Now we've taken those five points, and you can see them in, the, in detail in the articles and the source in the bottom left, 
and we've had we've defined desired outcomes. So I won't go through them all, but for each point on the left in the right hand column, we have desired outcomes like, of course, sustained undetectable viral load in the world is not um, there yet, but also the other issues um, feeding into freedom from stigma and discrimination. So we've gone from you know global consensus panel to a WHO strategy with new targets, although not one specifically around quantifying good health-related quality of life, to including the LTS um, framework. So I think some of the priority areas moving forward are to continue to engage the community but through agreed on tools, patient reported outcome measures, and importantly, patient reported experience measures, using that in clinical practice um, as well. People-centered integrated health service delivery models, the topics of, of, of these IAS convened talks. Thinking about the availability of digital health technologies and tools and how we can avoid, avoid the digital divide as some people are left behind because they don't have access to the digital tools um, that more well-resourced countries and individuals will have. And finally, recognizing the importance of social determinants of health and inequity, stigma and discrimination, mental health, disability, and life uh, rehabilitation. So with that, I wish you a good meeting. I'd like to acknowledge everyone who contributed to the new WHO Global Health Sector Strategy and fed in in all those consultation sessions they held and everyone who's really continuing um, this fight. And thank you so much to the International AIDS Society for shining a light on this and prioritizing it in your work moving forward. Thank you. Brilliant. What a wonderful way to move from that consultation outcome into our own um, active dialogue period. So the room, the, the participants, and, and we recognize that there were some folks today who had the chance to share these evidence summaries, and more so the this consultation is full of leaders and practitioners and thinkers and doers um, who have, have led the field for, for many, many years. And it's an honor for everyone to be conversing about this topic today. We see a lot of issues coming up in the Jamboard and the chat, um, HIV and aging, health providers and, and those living with HIV and not living with HIV. And um, we are going to break into discussion groups. Each of the discussion groups is going to have one of the presenters in, and we do have six guiding questions that we would offer to provoke dialogue around the elements of PCC frameworks that appeal to you, what's missing, what does the evidence tell us, what are the current gaps, what should the priorities be, and um, how do we best operationalize person-centered care within the HIV response. These are all on the Jamboard. Um, we would ask the moderators of each group to, to try to refer to those and also just get open discussion. Um, I think, Emma, if, if folks could come back by quarter two. Um, yep, I realize that's, we're that's about five good. minutes off schedule, but we should be able to manage. And um, you will, I, I turn it over to Emma or Trevor or Lena, others who are, are operationalizing the breakout groups just now, but this is our chance for discussion. We're hoping to go around to each of the breakout rooms and if um, the, the moderator or someone they designate could give us a one minute or less summary of what you think were some of the really key takeaways, um, some of the main points that, are, that you discussed, that would be helpful. So I'm gonna start with, um, Chris, are you in a position to start? Sorry, you're first on my screen. Uh, sure, sure, happy to. Thanks. So great. So yes, in a minute, we just put out several different uh, reactions and ideas that people had seen the great presentations. Um, uh, Narari uh, raised issues such as uh, the need to have measures and, and principles in place to make sure health professionals living with HIV, that they're working in an environment where they can be respected and supported. Um, you know, really need to think about how the team of healthcare professionals involved in providing person-centered care can be helped in in working together as a team, uh, attending to confidentiality, confidentiality and data protection. Um, you know, Emmanuel also talked about the need to ensure that health providers are working together and really attend to that the interrelationships between different parts of the system for health and the different levels of uh, 
uh, of, of health professionals so that folks are working as a team. Uh, and Dawn just asked, how do we incorporate different personalities, um, healthcare workers and patients uh, to ensure we can really deliver person-centered care? Um, so interestingly, you're hearing a lot about, you know, the environment for healthcare workers and, and um, facilitating uh, communication and teamwork across different levels of the system for health. Thank you. Brilliant. The healthcare worker centered is part of patient centered and person centered. Um, Rod, you're next on my screen. Please may I invite you for your minute. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I wish we, we had more time, but <laughs> what, what, we have, we have, what we have um, realized from the entire conversation that we had is that um, it's pretty, pretty similar to what Chris mentioned that we should also um, understand the perspective of the healthcare providers in terms of how acceptable um, PCC is. Um, and also <clears throat> considering that many LMIC are um, experiencing a lot of, of, of limitations in their staff patient ratio, um, we should also try to um, focus more on funding and, and, and investment on widening the, 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 the number of professionals. And aside from that, um, one one impactful um, comment was made on the need to really address stigma and discrimination because integrated care and other services may be um, ineffective if we don't really address stigma and discrimination coming, especially coming from the healthcare providers. And that's it. And and also uh, one of a one of the participant um, Josephine also mentioned that we should also focus more on the livelihood and and. Um, social economic um, support for the clients. So that's it from me, Laura. Back to you. Powerful points. Thank you for such a distinct presentation. Um, the next group, I, I got word from Alvin that we're actually going to invite Riss to, to be the presenter. So if you could hit a couple of the key highlights in a minute or less, we would be grateful. And um, again, championing your middle of the night participation. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Larissa Oris. I'm calling in from Brisbane in Australia. So yeah, it is the middle of the night here. Um, yeah, in, in our conversation, um, um, one of the things that we were considering was um, just in terms of the journey of the, the patient and how in HIVs, that, um, certainly from my own perspective, it's been over 30 odd years now. And so the needs, um, you know, that, I have have certainly changed over that period of time and they will continue to change. And so in terms of the kind of conversation I want to be able to have with my um, physicians or, or clinics is in terms of them meeting me with where I'm at now, maybe being interested in asking what is my biggest concern? What, how can I be, you know, the best version of myself or my holistic person um, for the quality of life? What are my needs right now? And that may well be um, social determinants that need to be um, um, sort of solutioned first to, you know, to help get the healthcare need. Um, and so I think that needs to be part of the conversation between the clinician and the patient. Um, the cl clinician being ready to ask the question around well, where's the patient at and, and where, where any issues may or barriers may be arising for them. I hope that's helpful, Elvin. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. And, and sorry, we don't have more time. Um, the next group uh, on my screen, Ibu. Yes, um, thanks. Uh, what we discussed is that really uh, all the elements of the PCC framework resonate with, uh, with us for the HIV response. But one thing that uh, my group uh, did really um, uh, raise is that during the whole presentation and session, nobody touched on aging. And Jill mentioned that uh, that issue, and by saying that well, it, within the U.S., he might not have an issue uh, talking to uh, his medical doctor. Uh, he can go to the consultation, have uh, the basic care. But when it's come to aging, uh, the system is not set up to provide really geriatric care uh, uh, within the uh, U.S. health system right now. And uh, his initiative right now is also group. Uh, within the US is to really create some geriatric care for people living with HIV. In the other hand, Deborah from Nigeria say, well, you know, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation that one solution does not fit all, you know, if you don't have even the basic need uh, much within the uh, developing country, 
aging even is not an option because you won't reach there. And so those are uh, uh, the issues that we discussed. What also we raise is that what we need to do is really be able to monitor whatever system we put in place because the system should be flexible enough to accommodate the characteristic of your demographics. Uh, so you should see if you're providing care to young people versus uh, people aging. And that's, that monitoring has to be done for IPCC to be very successful. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you for representing those conversations. And Daisy, I would please invite you to, to represent some of the dialogue in your group for, for the final minute. Hi, Laura, Daisy, Daisy's in a kind of a noisy place, so she asked me to, to take this on for our group. Yes. Um, so we had a really good discussion. Um, I think both Daisy and Diego raised the, the, the big challenge around um, as, you know, as on the ground civil society groups providing person-centered care approaches the sustainability of funding for their projects. So a lot of their work is very project-based funding um, and they get the, the good results and the programs getting going and then um, that, that funding comes to a stop quite quickly. And so it's just that constant cycle of, of needing to, to get um, additional funding. And some barriers that they've faced um, that, that Daisy uh, mentioned in particular was around um, faith-based organizations um, reviewing their funding proposals and, and not necessarily approving of, of the approaches that they feel that they need to, to make a difference. Um, and then we, our group actually had a question for um, the, the systematic um, literature review team and it was just a sort of an observation and further discussion around that kind of um, impact of only around 50% of the impact on the um, HIV outcomes for the person-centered care approaches, but wanting to understand that in more detail, because if, if it was a very big, uh, impactful impact, um, and just the size of, I guess, the impact that that, that was had on those individuals. Um, so just kind of wanting to dig into that a little more. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. And I think we've, we've, I, I scanned through the Jamboard and encourage people to keep using that. Um, and, and I think we touched on at least all of the major themes. There are a few others I saw terminology and the meanings of terminology, patient, people, person. Um, also tensions, or, or there was some discussion about the tension between the need to measure outcomes and the need to think holistically. So how do we avoid um, over medicalizing and, and focusing on the disease when we we do want to see how things are changing and then you know that also gets around quality of life measurement and, and measuring um, just non clinical outcomes. Um, also saw you know a lot around stigma which came up a little bit in the groups but but a real significant thing on the Jamboard as well and and um, I think some of the practicality is stuff client ratios and and then cost effectiveness so. Um, we've got four minutes. I know that Emma needs two to sort of close us out and finish up, but I see, um, Jules, you have your hand up. Could we invite you, do you for, for one minute? I think that's all we have. Is that sufficient or at least enough for now? Yes, I just want to say um, that it was me who said that what we need is geriatric care for the elder and older patient population over 65 over 70 and that's what was missing in the discussion today and that's what's needed globally is uh, hiv geriatric care in hiv clinics all over the world we're beginning to have it in the u.s but it's very very it's just starting up in the u.s and it's nowhere else and it's a little bit in europe but it needs to be everywhere and that's enough for now thank you emma and everybody else thanks thank jules so and Emma, I am going to turn it. Thank you to all of the presenters and everyone for your participation. Thank you for the, the pleasure of being with you today. And um, Emma, please, please close out as needed. Great. Thank you. Having a little issue with my screen sharing again, but hopefully we're going to get there. Can you see that? Oh, Lord. Give me one second.
Can you see the slides now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for your participation today. I just wanted to highlight that the next meeting in this series will be on the 25th of May. So it's basically four weeks from now, um, where we will be digging further into these issues. Um, and investigating what is the service delivery considerations provide for providing integrated person-centered care. Um, so please uh, go ahead and join us then. That will be the same link that you used today. Um, and we will be sharing um, pre-reading um, and some you know, additional thoughts for reflection after this meeting. The Jamboard will be open for another sort of 24 hours. So feel free to, um, to, to continue um, sharing your thoughts there. So, oh, with that, I will say thank you very much for your contribution today. Um, and thank you so much to Laura for moderating the session. Thanks thank everyone.